to get into chapter 3b bioenergetics we're going to continue our discussion from last week where we introduced bioenergetics um, I'm going to apologize ahead of time because I have an entire house full of people so you may hear babies screaming in the back you might hear children screaming in the back you may hear my wife screaming at screaming children and screaming babies so do your best to uh, ignore the chaos and I will do my best to ignore the chaos as well and try to deliver you the best possible lecture I can with everyone being home so having said that um, today we're going to get into a little bit about uh, enzymes enzyme functions some enzyme characteristics last week we talked about exergonic and endergonic reactions and we're going to talk about how enzymes play a big role in reducing that activation energy um, of course all of glycolysis all of um, beta oxidation all of these metabolic processes in the body that have to do with energy thus i have energy pathways um, are all created by enzymes they all have robust um, catalytic reactions which allow us to create energy and take substrates and turn them into energy so with no further ado let's get into this and start talking about some of the basic characteristics characteristics of uh, enzymes this is something you already know this is nothing new so um, we'll just kind of talk about some of the basic functions and then get into uh, what they do specifically okay so we know that enzymes are proteins right we know that um, proteins are created linearly first right just a single strand of amino acids that are bound together by uh, peptide bonds right we know that those proteins um, those amino acids within the protein they contain R chains and those R chains all have very unique structures and functions right some are acidic some are uh, hydrophobic some are hydrophilic some are charged some are not charged um, so all these R chains on the amino acids have very unique properties and unique characteristics and that's what helps the linear protein kind of take shape right so you'll have some hydrogen bonding among those R chains you'll have some disulfide bonds you'll have some van der Waals forces kind of all working together to take a line of amino acids and turn them into a three-dimensional shape which we call a tertiary structure right so essentially uh, enzymes are proteins right uh, but they are catalytic so they make reactions happen and without these ends oops sorry about that without these enzymes most cellular reactions would take place way too slowly and we would not sustain life all right so we owe a tremendous amount of debt and gratitude towards enzymes that keep our asses alive um, so I told you that uh, these things are tertiary proteins we also call them globular proteins um, RNA molecules are not globular right so if you look at RNA molecules if you think about messenger RNA those are a single strand of amino acids um, nucleotides sorry tied together in a single linear strand where proteins uh, enzymes fold upon each other and make that tertiary structure um, they're very efficient catalysts uh, and they can they can increase the rate of reactions substantially okay um, and they have essentially massive catalytic power and they're highly highly specified and some of them require regulation and why do we need regulation well because we don't want enzymes just taking substrates and creating products at their own will um, we do need some type of regulation so that they are acting as these catalytic proteins when they are necessary right because when the cell and things with inside the cell start losing regulation and it just starts to do what it's what it wants that's the characteristics we start to see in cancer right when when the cell just divides uh, when it wants it has no regulation when the cell is producing products uh, that are hazardous and toxic um, these are things that basically loss of regulation leads to a disease state so if we look at some of these reactions that we were talking about last week we can see how enzymes play a role in this right so this is something that you're kind of used to seeing we saw something very similar to this last week right so we can see that the amount of energy that is needed for a reaction to take place with a non-catalyzed reaction so this is without an enzyme 
um, a reactant has to get over this big barrier here, right? We call this activation energy, right? And then once it overcomes this activation energy, well, then it has the energy that is released by an act by um, a reaction, okay? So we know that a substrate is going to come in. So a substrate or a reactant is the same same thing. They're synonymous. If we want to create a product, which is what an enzyme does, right? It takes a reactant or a substrate and it transforms it into a product. In order for us to do that, we have to invest some energy, right? So without enzymes, we can see that this barrier is pretty pretty tall, right? That's a that's a lot of energy that we have to do. We have to invest in order to get this substrate into this product. Now, if you look over here and we look at the catalyzed reaction, we see the same players, but we notice a key difference, and that's that this wall here, this activation energy, is substantially lower, right? So you see the difference here to here. And now that reactant has way less energy that it has to invest, and it has an equally great uh, energy released by that reaction, right? So less energy activation, same amount of released energy compared to this one where we have greater activation energy and then an amount of energy released, right? So both are taking reactants to products or substrates to products. But when we have an enzyme, it releases this, it reduces this activation energy substantially, which is going to make what happen? It's gonna make the reaction happen faster, right? And it's going to help us keep uh, keep on living. So here's the activation energy here. Here's the activation energy here. So those are some things to just kind of pay attention to, okay? And essentially what the enzyme is doing, it is reducing the activation barrier and it is accelerating the reaction, all right? So that's how it makes things happen quicker. So if we look at this model here, we can see an enzyme, and this enzyme just has a very specific shape, right? Again, enzymes are proteins, so proteins do fold, and when they fold, they take on a very specific form, right? And that form has a very specific function. So when it comes to proteins, form and function is important. And when it comes to substrates and enzymes interacting to make a product, you can see how the form is very specific. So here we have two substrates coming together, right? Or two reactants coming together. And these two combined are going to fit perfectly into this portion of the enzyme here. And this is the active site, right? So the active site is where the reaction is going to take place. Okay, so without getting into too much detail about enzymes, essentially what's going to happen is this active site, I told you it's a protein, right? So it has amino acids, this active site here, is going to have amino acid R chains protruding out this way into an aqueous solution. Some of these might be positively charged, some of them might be negatively charged. And those R chains are going to interact with the R chains that are protruding out from these proteins, right? So basically they're going to be they're going to gravitate towards one another based upon the property of their R chains. So let's say all these R chains right here in this active site are positive and all of these R chains here are negative, and because these are positive and these are negative, they're going to attract to one another, and they're going to make this induced fit, all right? So what we call this here, once the substrate is bound, we call this the enzyme substrate complex. And this is a holding station here, so when the substrates bind to the enzyme, there's going to be a pause in reaction, and that's because the enzyme needs to make sure that this substrate is correct and once it identifies that the substrate is correct, this enzyme is going to undergo what we call a conformational change. So it's going to change its shape ever so slightly. And what does that do? That locks these substrates into place. So I want you to imagine that you take a key and you stick it in the keyhole. Now, most keys will slide into a keyhole. Now, when you try to turn that key to the right, uh, only one particular key will fit, right? So if you have a key, um, a key ring with five keys and you don't know which key opens the door, you would stick one in, turn it to the right. If it doesn't move, well, that's not the right key. You pull it out, stick another key in, turn it to the right. If it doesn't turn, that's not the right key. Let's say you get to the fourth key, you put that one in, it slides in, you turn it to the right and the door unlocks. Well, now you know that you've identified the right key that turning of the key to the right is the conformational change, right? So that lock is changing its shape. 
It's the same thing that happens here. When the enzyme binds to the substrate complex, it's going to undergo a small conformational change that will lock this in place, and then it will finish the reaction, right? So the, cata the um, catalytic reaction will occur, and then a product will be released, okay? And then we don't lose enzymes in this process. It just recycles itself, and it receives another group of substrates, right? So this is how glycolysis works. This is how ATP produced from creatine kinase works in the uh, phosphogenic system or the um, phosphocreatine system. This is how energy is produced in the citric acid cycle. We will receive a product, right? We can say that this is glucose. Glucose comes into the cell. It interacts with hexokinase, which is the first enzyme in the cell of glycolysis. A hexokinase will interact with glucose and it will convert it into glucose 6-phosphate, right? So once it converts it to glucose 6-phosphate, the new product is glucose 6-phosphate and then the enzyme resets itself to receive another molecule of glucose, right? Now, this product here will become a new substrate for the next enzyme, right, in glycolysis and we'll, we'll talk about that momentarily. Okay, so just keep all of that in mind. So again, enzymes do not cause the reaction to occur. They just accelerate the reaction, okay? And here I have some, I put some um, text down there that you can look at and you can just kind of read at your own pace in your own time, okay? Um, in pathology, uh, we use enzymes as diagnostic tools. So when a cell is damaged, we can measure enzymes in the blood. So that should tell you that in normal physiological conditions, enzymes should be housed in the cell okay we don't want a high level of enzymes floating around in the blood so we call these biomarkers right and when we have high levels of certain enzymes in the blood that tells us that a tissue is in distress somewhere and then that di that distressed tissue is releasing its content into the bloodstream right so uh, the fifth phospholipid the phospholipid bilayer is destructed it's destroyed and the contents within that cell are now seeping into the um the um aqueous solution surrounding the cell right so the interstitial space sorry you can probably hear the baby in the background um, so it's diagnostic application um, when we see certain enzymes like lactate dehydrogenase or creatine kinase in the blood that may indicate a heart attack right so if we take blood and we wanted to see if somebody did have a myocardial infarction um, if we see lactate dehydrogenase or creatine kinase both um, enzymes that play a role in energy production well that tells us that one of the cardiomyocytes are damaged right the heart tissue is damaged so enzymes are um, susceptible to changes in the body right they're a protein and like most proteins um, they don't like excessive heat all right so Enzymes, a small rise in body temperature in temperature can increase enzyme activity, okay? Now, if enzyme activity increases, then that means the metabolic process that uh, we need to undertake in order to create an energy, that, that hastens as well, or that becomes quicker as well. But enzymes can go, if the body temperature continues to rise, then excessive heat will denature enzymes. And what does that mean? Is That means that tertiary structure, right? That folded protein will uh, denature itself and become linear, right? So high amounts of temperature can um, basically break the form of a protein, make it linear, thereby impacting the function of it. Okay, so when we exercise, uh, small increases in body temperature are good for enzymatic activity, but then when we have excessive increases in, in temperature, that can denature uh, both the proteins and the enzymes and decrease activity. So, um, you know, when we start to look at things like heat stroke and um, uh, let's like a dehydration because of heat, right? Heat cramps in the muscle uh, when the when the temperature becomes excessive. Well, that's going to have an impact on those biochemical processes in the cell and also the proteins in the cell. Um, 
And they're also susceptible to changes in pH, right? Both increases and decreases in pH. So um, they can have a pretty profound impact on enzyme form and function again um, because of pH, right? And why, why is pH an issue? Well, a contracting skeletal muscle produces a lot of hydrogen ions, right? Especially if um, glucose is coming into the cell. So let's say that we're exercising anaerobically, right? And we're taking glucose and we're converting it to lactic acid, right? Um, well, we have a lot of hydrogens, uh, hydrogen ions released in that process. And that can alter both the pH of the cellular environment and also the pH in the interstitial space, which is that aqueous solution between cells. And uh, if that hydrogen gets into the bloodstream, it can have an impact on uh, blood pH as well, right? So we naturally challenge temperature and we naturally challenge uh, acidity and, you know, basic um, pH uh, during exercise and I have some pictures here to kind of show you that so if we look at enzyme activity with temperature we can see that at 98.6 like right here at this 40 degrees Celsius um, this is where we have a perfect enzyme function right so enzymes like to function at our natural body temperature now if we move to that a little bit more right so let's say we start to exercise and we move into like 98.9 or 99 degrees right we know when we exercise we do have a slight increase in temperature look at the behavior of this line here there is a slight increase now you can notice here that once we get to this point then we have this sudden drop right so if we exceed this temperature of 40 degrees celsius right we will get a slight advantage and if we exceed if we get close to 50 degrees celsius um, we will start to denature and damage the enzymes that we need to help us create energy during exercise um, and the same thing is kind of true here when we have a decrease in temperature right if we move down to this kind of 37 36 degrees celsius you can see that the nature of the enzymes kind of decrease their catalytic activity a little bit and as we go down in temperature even more, we can see that there's a steady decrease in enzymatic function, right? So this one, we have a little more room to play with in the cold category, but heat, uh, enzymes are very sensitive to heat. You can see the difference between this and this, right? Just a couple of degrees. So keep that in mind. Enzymes like to function at a very specific temperature, which is body temperature. Um, they will increase acti activity, which is favorable when we start to increase body temperature during exercise. Um, so, and as we kind of leave this uh, comfortable range here, right, normal body temperature without exercising, we start to decline as the body gets colder, right? So from here to here, favorable, from here to here, favorable. And then once we get past this, let's say it's like 42 degrees Celsius, then we see the sharp decline in enzyme function. All right. So if we look at the same thing with uh, pH, well, obviously the where we want our pH to be is 7.4. So we'll say that's here. Enzymes like to function uh, more favorably between 7.4 and 8. And that's that's cool because when we exercise, like I said, we are going to have hydrogen ions building up. Um, but the body has, the muscle has ways of buffering that and removing that. So if we start to have um, just acute hydrogen ion uh, condensation or accumulation, sorry about that, um, that will be favorable. But if the hydrogen ion um, collection or accumulation becomes too much, then you can see that the enzyme function is going to decline. The same thing over here. If we go more basic, enzyme function declines. So ideally, uh, enzyme function likes to be between 7.4 and 8 on the pH, which is physiological pH. Plus with exercise, that's, that's pretty close to what we see with changes in pH during exercise. Okay, so enzymes are highly specific. They reduce activation energy. Um, they have a lock and key type of interaction with substrates, right? Um, they are sensitive to heat. They are also sensitive to pH. Both heat and pH change with exercise. Um, they can become favorably changed if there's just a slight increase in heat and pH, uh, but they can have negative uh, effects if that pH or that temperature keeps increasing, right? So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, 
going back to the diagnostic piece, um, you know, some of the things that we see in blood when we are looking at people that may have had a heart attack, um, you know, we do see lactate dehydrogenase. There is a specific isoform in the heart, and that's the one that we can identify if there's a mitocardial infarction. Creatine kinase, same thing if we have mitochondrial infarction or if we have striated skeletal muscle dystrophy because the only place creatine kinase really exists is in the heart muscle and in the striated skeletal muscle, right? Um, so we shouldn't see too much of that circulating in the blood. Uh, alkaline phosphatase, this is what we see in cancer, certain types of cancer, amylase. Um, amylase is both in the mouth and we see it in the pancreas. So if we have pancreatitis, if we have that inflammation of the pancreas and that tissue has become a damaged, we'll see amylase floating around within the circulation. So just to kind of show you how these biomarkers can be diagnostic and we can um, use them to determine if a uh, tissue is damaged or compromised. Um, there's a couple of classifications of enzymes. I'm going to tell you right now that we will probably see these on the exam. Okay. So most all enzymes have this ACE at the end. We know that that tells us that we're dealing with an enzyme. Um, kinases are very important because in metabolism, kinases will add a phosphate group uh, to a substrate or to a molecule or to an enzyme or to a protein. So these are very, very robust when we're talking about metabolism. Uh, same with dehydrogenase, right? Dehydro, right? Dehydro, uh, dehydrogenase. Oh my God, I'm stumbling over that. Dehydrogenase, right, is removing a hydrogen ion, right? We see that in D. Um, oxidase, it catalyzes oxygen reduction reactions involving uh, oxygen. So that would be transferring electrons and hydrogens, right? Reducing and um, oxidizing. Um, and then there's a couple more over here that you can look at. Um, isomerase, this is a rearrangement of atoms within a molecule. So isomerase will change the form of a specific molecule, right? Um, synthase, this is a really important one because we talk about DNA um, synthase, DNA polymerase, DNA ligase, these things that will synthesize a amino acid um, strand or a protein, right? Create new bonds, right? Um, so these are just different types, different types of uh, enzymes that we'll kind of talk about within uh, metabolism as we're as we're moving deeper into this lesson. So keep that in mind. Um, here's kind of a take home message, just to kind of have you look over certain things in your book. Um, and I put these on here just to kind of say, hint, hint, wink, wink. If you're going to read your book and you want an A versus a B, because if you want an A in the class, you're going to have to read. This is some of the places I'm kind of guiding your eye to look at. OK, so my responsibility is to lecture you. I take full responsibility of that. I go into the book. I figure out what is most relevant. I put it on these PowerPoints. Um, and I'll do about 85% of the heavy lifting for you guys, but the other 15% is your responsibility. So when I do these take home messages, I'm, I'm trying to tell you where you need to look so that you can do some of the heavy lifting as well, okay? Um, so that's it for enzymes, okay? Now we're going to get into energy. So we're gonna get into some of the basic metabolic pathways here, okay? so. Uh, we talked about reactions, we talked about oxidation reduction, we talked about enzymes, right? These are all a part of creating energy through metabolism. So now we're going to look at ATP. Okay, so you guys should all know what ATP is. I'm going to do a very basic overview because adenosine triphosphate is the bread and butter. It's the currency when we talk about energy for exercise, but also energy for sustaining life. Um, we're going to get into that. We're going to talk about some of the characteristics of it, okay? Uh, ultimately, when we are eating food, we are trying to take a we're trying to take a macronutrient, break it down, pass some electrons, and create ATP. Right. Um, so within those processes, we have several, several, several catabolic reactions between a substrate to create a product. Right. An enzyme is going to make that happen. And then we're going to have a product that turns into a new substrate for an enzyme that's waiting to convert that into a brand new product. And it's going to go down, 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 down until we get into the mitochondria. The mitochondria is going to do a very similar thing. And then at the end of all this um, 
catalytic activity, we are going to get ATP. Okay, so that's what we're trying to do at the end of the day. So let's move into uh, this ATP business. So we're going to talk now about adenosine triphosphate, right? We're going to talk about how levels of adenosine triphosphate, how they fluctuate. And when they fluctuate, it's important for you to understand that those fluctuations emit signals within the cell into other tissues. Um, so ATP and it's the level of ATP, the concentration of ATP can um, induce signaling to other tissues in the body and can change um, can change the basic physiology of energy production. Okay, we're going to talk about creatine. We're going to talk about creatine kinase or phosphocreatine. Okay, so ATP, creatine, creatine and phosphocreatine, creatine kinase and ATP generation. Now, the first thing you should understand is that we are going to look at this through the lens of anaerobic and aerobic energy production, which is also synonymously known as anaerobic and aerobic metabolism. Okay, so you all know what ATP is, right? We know that this is energy used by the cells, right? It is, it is the ultimate currency for energy. It is used for multiple, multiple processes, very important for skeletal muscle contraction. Skeletal muscle contraction is going to take ATP, convert it into ADP. That ADP is then going to have to be reconverted back to ATP. So the the skeletal muscle cell is going to try very, very, very hard to maintain very high levels of ATP rather than ADP or AMP, right? So you know adenosine triphosphate, adenosine diphosphate, and adenosine monophosphate, okay? So this is an organic molecule that contains high energy bonds, right? These energy bonds are what's going to release energy and allow um, muscle to move. It's going to allow uh, enzymes to react. It's going to allow energy to be formed. Um, and this is what it looks like, right? So we have this adenine, right? And we have a ribose sugar ring here, right? Um, and then we have these phosphates, right? Inorganic phosphates. And they're all bound together, right? We have anhydride bonds. And then here we have an ester bond. So the bond between phosphate and phosphate here, phosphate and phosphate here are all similar. The bond between phosphate and the ribose sugar um, is very different, okay? Now we know that when we have... Um, energy released from ATP, okay, the high energy bonds are going to play a major role. We are going to have, when ATP converts to ADP, the first phosphate that's going to pop off is going to be here, and energy is going to be released, right? So we always start with the outside phosphate that makes most sense. We're not going to start here. Um, if the energy demand is still high, and we are left with adenosine tri, I'm sorry, diphosphate, well, then we'll lose another phosphate here, and we'll be left with adenosine monophosphate, right? Tri, all three of them, di, just two of them, and one monophosphate, okay? And we can have levels of AMP in the cell. We can have levels of this adenosine monophosphate in the cell, and that's not a good thing because that will change the energy signaling in the cell, right? ADP, adenosine diphosphate, will also change the energy signaling in the cell. So whatever happens, whatever you are doing, whatever type of exercise you are engaged in, your body is trying very hard to get ATP levels very high in the cell. Okay, this is something that is going to be in, incredibly important for the rest of your time at HSU. If you do any master's level classes with me, uh, you will use this as well. If you are training athletes, you should know this by heart. Um, this is a very important graph, and to this day, I still use this when I train my athletes. And I'll tell you a story why in a little bit. Okay, So this graph is called the ATP Source and Time Association Plot. Okay, and let's take a second to kind of familiarize ourselves with what's going on here. On the bottom, we have time, right? You can see two seconds, 10 seconds, 60 seconds, two hours, all right? So here we can see that there is one, two, borderline three 
anaerobic energy systems. And then from here to here, obviously that's an aerobic system, right? So you can see that once we are two hours into exercise, we are primarily using fatty acids and using uh, mitochondria to create ATP, right? So let's look at what we have going on here. This is percentage of maximum rate of energy production, all right? So this is ATP, okay? So let's look at this first line here, okay? Let's figure out what's going on with this line. You can see that at the start of exercise, right, this here to here, this is, let's say this is zero seconds, skeletal muscle cells have a pool of ATP just floating around and ready to go, okay? Now, what this graph should tell you is that ATP pool, depending on the intensity, can be depleted very quickly. So you can see we start here. This is just some arbitrary number just telling you that we have a lot of ATP in the cell. And the moment we start exercising, that ATP plummets. And in about two seconds, it's gone, okay? And if it's really high intensity, like let's say you were doing um, plyometrics, right? You're doing jump drills, really high force production, repetitive force production, well, then that's going to go even faster, right? So the takeaway message for this first line is that skeletal muscle has a finite amount of ATP in the cell ready to go when there is a demand for energy, all right? But we know that has a shelf life of only about two seconds. But that's okay because we have a fail-safe. You can see that as... ATP, that storage in the cell, starts to deplete Well, something comes to its rescue. And you can see right here that at the onset of exercise, it already starts to increase its activity, right? It crosses paths here, and then it is elevated here. So now we have the ATP PC system, and that is creatine, um, creatine kinase, phosphocreatine system, okay? They also call this the phosphogenic system. So as ATP stores start to deplete within two seconds, there is another system that revs up and starts to create ATP anaerobically, right? Now, this system only has about 10 seconds of life, right? Do you see that? It kind of goes up, kind of maxes out at five seconds, and then it depletes at 10 seconds, all right? Well, that's okay. If you're exercising longer than 10 seconds, there's a third system that will come to the rescue and start producing energy. Now, this is ATP stores. This is creatine kinase, which is going to help replenish these ATP stores. And then we have this lactic acid system. And I don't like this name. We're going to change the name, but just to introduce you to it, I'm going to show you that as creatine kinase begins to plummet, Look at, there's another system that revs up, starts to increase its ability to create ATP and energy, and then right here at about 60 seconds, it starts to fall, okay? Now, at 60 seconds, you can see a T here, right? That means threshold, and here's threshold as well. So this is the threshold for the lactic acid system. So the lactic acid system is your body taking glucose into the cell, right? So when we exercise, um, your body releases glucagon from the pancreas. Glucagon communicates with the liver, and it tells the liver, hey, if you have any extra sugar stored in there, start putting it into the blood now because the skeletal muscles are going to need that sugar. So then the liver secretes the sugar. The sugar goes to the skeletal muscle. So the sugar gets into the skeletal muscle, and then it starts to break it down through glycolysis. Okay. Once it starts to break down in glycolysis, it has two pathways that it can go. It can be broken down anaerobically, which will then create lactic acid, or it could be broken down aerobically, which means that that sugar molecule will go into the mitochondria to enter the TCA cycle and to produce energy that way. So it's important for you to understand that sugar glucose can have two fates when it enters the cell. It can either go and get converted into lactic acid anaerobically, or if we're doing continuous exercise without any breaks and the intensity is lower, well, then that sugar is going to go, it's going to go through glycolysis, get converted into pyruvate, and then pyruvate is going to enter the mitochondria where it will undergo transformation to be turned into ATP.
Now, once we surpass 60 seconds, okay, you can see here the entire time the aerobic system has been kind of ramping up, okay? And it doesn't have the same trend as these other lines, right? Where it just depletes and it depletes. This continues to go up because the um, aerobic system, beta oxidation and fatty acids being used to create ATP, it's kind of unlimited, right? It creates a tremendous amount of energy and it's not necessarily the ATP that it creates, but it's those coenzymes, um, NAD and FAD, um, that are passing electrons that are helping it create a lot of energy in the mitochondria. Um, so this is very important that you understand time, okay? And these are just generic numbers because if we put somebody through an exercise training regimen um, and we get them highly conditioned, all of these things will change, right? We'll be able to have more stores. The ATP PC system will last 15 seconds instead of 10 seconds, right? The lactic acid system will last, uh, you know, 80 seconds versus 60 seconds. So all these things can change with training, okay? I just wanted to introduce you to that. And if we see here, overall performance, well, as ATP production begins to decrease, so does overall performance. But if you look here with aerobic activity, look at it kind of runs parallel, right? So this should tell you something about intensity, right? The higher the intensity of exercise, the quicker we'll burn through these, okay? If we do low intensity, right, low intensity, which was represented here, the quicker we'll get into aerobic metabolism and we'll use primarily aerobic metabolism, okay? But the other thing to point out here is look at the trend with this, 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 and this. These lines all cross one another, which tells you that these systems are on all the time. They're just happening at different ratios. It's not like one turns on and one turns off, right? When we get into aerobic activity, these things aren't turned off. They're just, we rely on them less, right? When we're using this, if we're doing high explosive training for 10 seconds, we're still using oxygen. You guys see that right there? We're still using oxygen and fatty acids. We're just not using them at the same degree as we are ATP stores and uh, creatine kinase and phosphocreatine systems, okay? So anaerobic, okay? This is the anaerobic system, and, oops, sorry about that, and this would be the aerobic system, okay? So keep that in mind. Now, here is another version of that, okay? I do not like the lactic acid system, so we are going to call this line, the green line, anaerobic glycolysis, because that is using sugar, okay? And what I did here is I added another line that we are talking, we're gonna call aerobic glycolysis. And you can see there's a difference here between when anaerobic glycolysis begins to deplete and when aerobic glycolysis begins to deplete, okay? So aerobic glycolysis does run into the aerobic system a little bit, all right? So keep in mind when we talk about this in the future, if I ever ask you on an exam to name these pathways, you have the ATP storage system, you have ATP creatine kinase system, you have not the lactic acid system, but the anaerobic glycolysis system. And then you have the aerobic glycolysis system. And then you have the aerobic system. So when I train athletes, I train them in these different metabolic pathways. And here's the story I want to tell you. I primarily train MMA athletes. Um, we just got two of our athletes into the UFC um, on, what was it, Jill, August 8th? we did it we flew to Vegas and we got um, two of our local fighters here got contracts on Dana White's contender um, and now they're professional fighters in the UFC so when we train these fighters right I'm gonna ask you a question and then I'm gonna be quiet for a couple of seconds and let you try to figure it out when we train fighters I'm gonna ask you first is a professional MMA athlete an anaerobic athlete or an aerobic athlete and I want you to think about that for a little bit I'm going to drop my water. Hang on. So some of you are probably saying, oh, they're totally anaerobic, right? They're, they're high power output. Um, you know, they're, uh, you know, quick twitch uh, fighters. And uh, 
they're discontinuous, right? They, they, they hit, they move, they breathe, they hit, they move, they breathe. They, they function primarily in the anaerobic system. Um, that's true. But however, their rounds are five minutes long. So now we have these athletes that depending on the type of fight they have, they're in all of these pathways at one time. The, the pathway is just shifting and it's shifting in real time, right? If you have somebody doing high power output for five minutes, we can't say that they are an anaerobic athlete because they're five minutes, right? So look at this. Where did we say the lactic acid system, right? The anaerobic glycolysis, where does that start to deplete? 60 seconds. So one minute in, okay? And then I told you that the aerobic glycolysis system is about a minute and a half in, right? And then we're the rest of the way we're dealing with aerobic system. So I told you, I told you these fighters compete for five minutes, right? So yes, they are burning through these systems, but they're also in this aerobic system, right? So when we train these fighters, and you might see me out on the HSU track with them, I have to train every one of these systems, right? So I have to break down their training regimen to have high power output in each one of these systems. So we'll consider the time frames that they're in and we'll design training regiments within two seconds. So we'll do two seconds rest, two seconds rest, two seconds rest. Then we'll do different training regiments where we'll do 10 seconds high power output with a two second rest, right? And then we'll do same thing with 60 seconds. So we will have to train them in these different time frames so that we make sure that we are hitting all of these metabolic pathways so that we are training them metabolically. Um, that way, when they get into the cage, they're capable of fighting, um, you know, sh shifting through these pathways uh, when, the, when the fight demands it, right? So what I call this is metabolic flexibility. Do we have, does this athlete have the flexibility to transition from here to here to here, maybe back to here, to here, maybe back to here, right? Um, and we got to create that flexibility in their training. So it's important you understand who you're working with, uh, what kind of athlete they are, what position they play, how much running they have, how much explosiveness they have. And you have to keep all this in mind because we got to train these pathways, right? So this is a very super, 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 super important picture, okay? Um, it's, under, it's important to understand that, uh, back to that flexibility thing, ATP homeostasis, right? Let's go back to our first lecture, chapter two. We talked about homeostasis. We talked about a set point that the body's trying to be at. Well, ATP, synthesis and breakdown, right? Synthesis and breakdown, it's in constant disequilibrium, right? So that means that if you're sitting here right now listening to me and you're writing notes with your hand and you're listening and... Um, typing things in while you're burning ATP, all right? ATP is allowing you to do all of that. And like I said, if we break down ATP, let's just say that this line is the breakdown, the body needs to try to regenerate that breakdown immediately, okay? The body does not want high levels of ADP floating around, okay? So this synthesis and this breakdown process is in constant disequilibrium, right? So ATP homeostasis, the body is always trying to get ATP back to high levels um, in the cell, okay? And you can see here that existing within a cell, we have the highest level of ADP, ATP and very low levels of ADP and AMP. So the cell constantly wants to get this high level of ATP in the cell, okay? Now, when we have high levels of ATP, so this slide is going to talk about what happens if we go from here to here to here. And this happens in exercise, right? If we're doing high intensity exercise, the conversion of ATP to AT ADP happens very fast. If there's no rest in that high intensity exercise, then we might move into AMP. So if you think about some of these, the criticism that um, CrossFit has, right? CrossFit is doing high intensity explosive lifts uh, over the course of an hour with no rest, right? Active rest. So now you have these people doing these compound movements and they're not giving their, their body a chance to regenerate ATP. They're just moving further and further away from that because there's no rest. It's constant explosive movements, it's high intensity, and that's where people are starting to get hurt. So I told you earlier that ATP levels in the cell 
can send out signals. It can change the way the cell metabolizes. It could also change the way the rest of the body metabolizes. So if we have high levels of ATP in the cell, which is what we want, right? That's what the body wants. That's the set point. Then that shows that the muscle cell has sufficient energy, right? And the body is in a happy place. Now, the cell will limit or restrict oxidation of substances, okay? Which means we will back off a little bit on beta oxidation, right? As I said, metabolism is a constantly changing ratio of those energy pathways, right? So the higher the ATP in the cell, the less oxidation that we're experiencing, okay? Now that's not to say that oxidation isn't the primary source of energy, beta oxidation, right? But if we have a high level of ATP in the cell, um, then we might have different ratios of other metabolisms, metabolic pathways happening at the same time, okay? So um, if um, we have high levels of ATP, the cell will promote the synthesis of macromolecules, okay? So that means we will be in an anabolic state. We will want to create, create new proteins, all right? Um, if there's high levels of ATP in the cell, that tells us to create, right? We're not at a deficit. Create new cells, create new enzymes, create new red blood cells, create, you know, um, new receptors that uh, line the cell phospholipid bilayer, okay? So that is a that is a time to fix and create. And the most important macronutrient macromolecule that happens in this condition is glycogen, all right? So glycogen, if we have high levels of ATP in the cell, um, skeletal muscle will want to create glycogen. What is glycogen? That is a Think of it as a storage shed, right? So you guys have all seen storage sheds. You, you have too much crap at your house. You go rent a storage shed. You pay a certain amount uh, a month to put uh, more crap in that storage shed. And that's what happens with glycogen. You take uh, excess glucose. You convert it into a polymer that um, is robust in the cell, right? So now you have a stored level of glucose in the muscle cell ready to go when you start to exercise. So it's it's a stored version of glycogen, right? So with high levels of ATP, we create high levels of glycogen, which means that there's a ready, readily available substrate to be used in the muscle when we start to exercise. That's, that's a beautiful thing. With athletes, we want to have high levels of glycogen in both the liver and both the skeletal muscle, right? Um, so glycogen production is very important when we think about giving our athletes a little bit of a break, like maybe one or two days off so that they can heal, not overtrain, and then resynthesize those glycogen molecules in, in the muscle and in the liver. Okay. Now what happens when we have a low ATP ratio to a, a moderate ADP ratio. Okay. So now we have this system, this scenario where ADP is higher in the cell and this is lower. That's going to change everything. That's a game changer. That tells the cell that there's not sufficient energy because we have more of this guy and less of this guy, right? So now the cell is going to increase cellular respiration. So here, right, we had less beta oxidation. Here we're going to increase that beta oxidation. So we're going to increase the ratio of beta oxidation to let's say glycolysis, all right? So now we're gonna request more beta oxidation. Okay, there it is. Macromolecules, macromolecules will be used. So whatever we stored here will now be dumped into the cell to be used as oxygen. So when does this happen? Well, this happens when we start to exercise, right? I showed you that. Let me go back really quick, right? Oh, sorry, I got a thing. Okay, I showed you that. ATP levels drop. What happens to this ATP? Well, it turns into ADP, right? So when we have those high levels of ADP, we increase cellular respiration, right? greater oxidation. We use glycogen that we were trying to store when we had high levels of ATP, right? Um, and then 
what happens when we get to AMP. I'll tell you that on the next slide, but before we get into that, I want to kind of tell you this, this ratio game between ATP and ADP, right? So in the skeletal muscle, right, in the sarcoplasm, we have a 200 to 1 ratio of ATP to ADP. So you can see that this is substantially more in the cell, right? But then when we exercise, we start to exercise, this plummets, right? And then this goes higher, right? Um, when we exercise more intensely and this ADP gets converted into AMP, well, that activates a stress protein. And you guys should know what a stress protein is because we talked about it in chapter two in our first week, right? Uh, I think we talked about heat shock protein. That was a stress protein. Well, here's another one, okay? And this one is a kinase. It is an enzyme that is sensitive to low energy in the cell. So if we have start exercising, right, we burn through all the ATP, then we have ADP, and then we burn through that, we have AMP, that's going to activate this stress protein um, because now the cell is in stress. The energy is so low that it needs to figure out how to get energy in faster to keep you exercising, okay? And... Um, this is, uh, we'll talk about this in a little bit. We're not going to talk about this right now, but um, basically these different isoforms of ATP, ADP, and AMP, they will directly interact with glycolysis, all right? So we'll talk about that in a little bit, all right? So these are essentially signaling molecules, right? If we have a lot of this, it'll say, hey, glycolysis, slow down. If we have a lot of this, it will say, hey, glycolysis, speed up. If it has a lot of this, it's going to say, okay, we need glycolysis and we need some other things to happen much faster because we're in cell distress. And that's kind of what this is saying here. So um, you can see here in this picture that ATP is obviously going to give off the most energy, right? So it's the highest energy level, right? Um, it has an activation energy, all right? And then you can see it releases a tremendous amount of energy, all right? Now, ADP, you can look at here, okay, has an activation energy, but it releases way less energy, right? So ATP is going to have more energy potential. Um, ADP is going to have less energy potential than ATP, and you can see AMP here has very low energy potential, all right? Um, so that kind of shows you that as we burn through this and we get here, and then we get here, the cell starts to go into distress because these two just don't have the same energy potential as ATP. I told you that when we have a low level of ATP and we start to have a higher ratio of ADP to ATP, and then we, you know, as if we're continuing to do high intensity exercise, we're burning through ATP faster than we can recreate it. Then we get into AMP levels uh, exceeding ATP levels. That is what causes stress in the muscle cell. Um, so when we get levels of ADP and AMP, and those ratios are high, we activate a kinase called AMP kinase or also known as AMPK. So keep that in mind, okay? Um, this is activated when intracellular ATP levels are low. Now, here's what's really interesting about this protein. Um, it's activated both in exercise scenarios and in disease conditions such as type 2 diabetes. So this is, again... I'm going to keep telling you throughout the uh, semester that exercise is medicine, right? Um, and when we look at how pharmaceutical companies are targeting certain proteins to get them to activate to help alleviate diabetes, well, you're going to see that exercise does the exact same thing. It acts on the exact same protein. So if you've ever heard of the medication called metformin, that is the most popular type 2 diabetic medication around. It's been prescribed since the 70s. Um, one of its mechanisms of action is this AMP kinase or AMPK. So exercise is medicine because if you just get off the couch and start to exercise a little bit, um, you can completely reverse type 2 diabetes because it's, it's acting on the same mechanisms. Okay. Um, AMPK promotes catabolic pathways, right, to generate more 
ATP. It's also going to inhibit anabolic pathways. That makes that makes perfect sense, right? I told you before, if the ATP is high in the cell, well, that will create more macromolecules, right? That will be catabolic. I'm sorry, anabolic. If energy is low and ATP is low, well, then it's got to be catabolic because we got to start breaking other things down to help create energy, all right? And exercise and disease are very similar where you could have, um, you know, if you're exercising intensely, chronic ATP reduction. Same thing in a disease state, especially like a metabolic state um, with like type, type 2 diabetes, you'll have chronic depletion of ATP because they're metabolically compromised and they can't create ATP the same way that healthy individuals can, okay? Um, so don't be, don't be afraid uh, of this picture. I just wanted to kind of show you how this works, right? So here's AMPK. Okay, AMP kinase, right? When it's activated, you can see that exercise will activate it, right? Um, we can see low nutrients like glucose can activate it, right? So that's what we would see in um, diabetics, right? Diabetics can't get glucose into the cell. If they can't get glucose into the cell, they can't metabolize it. They can't create uh, ATP, and that tells the cell that uh, it's in distress, so both exercise and pathology or pathological states can activate this uh, protein. So look what happens when we activate it. Okay? It accelerates glucose metabolism. It accelerates lipid metabolism. It also tells the cell to grow. Okay? Um, and it will induce transcription factors that will help create more proteins to help with metabolism. Right? Um, so the big takeaway here is that when we have high levels of ATP, ADP, apologize, saying that over and over again gets uh, like a tongue twister. When we have high levels of AMP, that activates this protein. And this protein tells the rest of the body to accelerate glucose metabolism, accelerate lipid metabolism. Okay, that's the, that's the takeaway right there. Um, here's another picture of it. Um, energy demand, AMPK activation, it will increase glucose uptake and it will do that through GLUT4 transporters. So glucose cannot get into the cell unless these GLUT transporters uh, allow it to come in. And you should know that because of what we did on the introductory um, video that I sent you guys. Remember I showed you the diabetes pathway, the insulin pathway, and I showed you that GLUT4 transporter. Well, AMPK tells that transporter to basically put it into fifth gear and take up uh, take up more glucose. Um, AMPK targets an enzyme called phosphofructose kinase, right? During glycolysis, it's going to tell phosphofructose kinase to increase its activity. And AMPK also tells fatty acids to um, get to the muscle faster to be activated. And you can see all of these things help produce more ATP, right? So um, the takeaway here is that ATP, ADP, and AMP are all signaling molecules, right? We know that if ATP gets low, ADP gets high, we start to signal other enzymes to signal other fuel sources to get to the cell to help create more ATP, right? And I'm not going to um, go too much more into depth on that. I just want you to know that. Um, also, AMPK responds to high levels of calcium. So where do we see an increase in calcium? And you should all be saying muscle contraction because when a muscle contracts, it can't contract unless calcium has left um, a, a, a container in the cell and has flooded the sarcoplasm, right? So it cannot contract unless there are high levels of calcium floating around in the cell, all right? So muscle contraction itself will activate this, all right? So we could take a pill, right, a diabetic pill, and uh, target this protein, or we could just get up and exercise and target that protein and do the exact same thing, okay? So exercise is medicine, okay? And ultimately, AMP kinase is just going to generate more ATP for the working cell. Um, so now we'll talk a little more about this uh, ATP. Okay, we know that we have um, these adenosine, ribose ring, and three phosphates together. When we synthesize ATP, it looks like this, right? So we have ADP plus 
an inorganic phosphate and that makes ATP. And then the breakdown would be ATP. Um, and then we have an enzyme here that helps release a phosphate and create energy, right? So we have the production of ATP and an enzyme helps release a phosphate to create energy. Um, just very basic nomenclature that you just kind of need to see, okay? Um, here is another process, right? So we can see that we have ATP, just kind of showing you a different version of it. Okay, we have ATP uh, ACE and water, and that helps create this breaking of the bond. And then we have ADP and a free inorganic phosphate, right? Just beating a dead horse here, just kind of showing you some different variations of it. Water plays a very important role, and we call that ATP hydrolysis, right? So the release of an inorganic phosphate through using water and also the release of energy. Boom, there it is. And I am going to, in this lecture right there, um, I have about 15 slides left, but um, I don't want you to be overwhelmed because we are delivering this via online. I can't see your faces. I can't see how frantically you're taking notes. I can't interact with you. So I'm going to stop here and I will upload the other 15 slides within the next few days. So there's gonna be a second part to this lecture. Like I said, chapter three goes a little slower because it's metabolism. Um, and you know, I wanna make sure you guys are prepared for higher level classes. Uh, if you're gonna do a master's, you gotta make sure you understand all of this very well. Um, so I'm in no hurry to get through this. So just kind of look at this right now. I will be reading your journal response, not your journal responses, your lab responses within the next day or two here. And then I will get this uh, recording, the second part of this lecture to you guys by the end of the week. So that's it. Have a good day and I'll be in touch.